The watch you see here is a Rolex. It was sold in 2017 for $18 million. Rolex produces its watches in limited editions and works on demand. This makes Rolex watches rare and valuable. It also increases the demand for Rolex watches and drives up prices. But I won't tell you why Rolex watches are expensive in this video. That's for another video. We are going to learn the story of the orphan boy behind the Rolex brand and how he created the Rolex brand. By the time Hans was 12 years old, his parents had died within a year of each other. His uncles sold his father's business and put some money into his education. He had two siblings. All three were sent to a boarding school called Ernestium Coburg in Bavaria, Germany, ostracized in school because of their culture and faith. This made him devote himself to his studies. He excelled in math. He also mastered the English and French languages. He was very interested in traveling. At school, he befriended a Swiss boy who came from a place called Le Chaux de Fun, which was known for making watches. The more he talked about it, the more interested Hans became. When he was 19, he decided that he could learn nothing more from school and left. He was going to leave Germany for Switzerland. In Geneva, he found a job as an apprentice in an international pearl trading company. This company bought pearls from various countries, sorted them according to quality, and sold them to jewelers for high profits. He learned something important about business life in this company. In fact, the company he worked for was buying pearls from pearl manufacturers, packaging and selling them to jewelers. They were earning thousands of dollars without adding any extra value. He loved his work life. He was earning very good money for his young age. One day Hans received a letter from a friend working at Kuno Korten. The letter said that he had been invited to Kuno Korten, which produced the highest quality watches of that period. It was a job offer. Kuno Korten was one of the largest and highest quality watch manufacturing enterprises at the time, exporting pocket watches worth around 1 million Swiss francs annually. Although Hans wanted to work at his current job because it was teaching, he was particularly interested in the Kuno Korten business because of his curiosity about watches and watchmaking. At Kuno Korten, using his English writing and reading skills, he was hired as an English reporter and clerk. He started with a monthly salary of 80 Swiss francs. But Wilsdorf's work was not limited to focusing on documents and correspondence. He was also responsible for assembling and verifying the accuracy of hundreds of pocket watches every day. This process helped him learn the intricacies of watchmaking and gain a great deal of knowledge about how all types of watches were made. During his time at Kuno Korten, Hans Wilsdorf gained tremendous experience with watches, which later played a major role in his founding of his own watch brand, Rolex, and his success in the watch industry. This was the foundation of Wilsdorf's passion for watches and his career. However, his time there was short-lived. He had to return to Germany and do military service. After only two years in the army, working for Kuno Kortin at the age of 22, he moved to London, England, to work for another company producing high-quality watches. He worked in this company for two years and increased sales very successfully. He was using the business skills he had learned in his previous job. During this period, he started planning to start his own watch business. During those years, he also met and married Florence Francis May Crati. Hans told his wife's father, who was in a very good financial situation, about his business plans. Hans told him that he was confident enough to open his own watch business, but he just needed some capital. In 1905, they founded Wilsdorf and Davis Latide, which would later become Rolex. A few years later, they partnered with a Swiss watch company called Hermann Agler, headquartered in Switzerland, and started the business. They imported movements from Switzerland to the UK and assembled them into watch cases and opened an office beyond Switzerland to support the partnership there. Soon they specialized in distributing watches at affordable prices. Although Hans was a watch lover, he had innovative ideas instead of pocket watches. Wrist watches were mostly worn by women as jewelry and were despised by some for not telling the exact time. These watches were much smaller than pocket watches and consisted of smaller movements that caused the time to regularly move faster or slower due to small details in the movements. This was the main reason why pocket watches were more popular at the time and were considered masculine due to their bulky size, but for Hans they were often inconvenient to use. Every time he put his hand in his pocket to see the time, especially when his hands were busy, 
it was a bit inconvenient for him. By then, it was considered almost impossible to create a perfect wristwatch that could consistently show the exact time and be in daily use. Hans predicted that wristwatches would sooner or later become the new norm for everyone, and they were. So he fully committed himself to finding a way to create the perfect wristwatch and spent the next few years traveling around Europe, researching what a successful and profitable wristwatch should look like. Eventually, he began to market his own wristwatches. In the same year, he founded his company and started manufacturing a watch. One after another, applying what he had learned from other watchmakers on his travels, he tried to create a better, high-quality and reliable wristwatch for men and women. Soon his company started to gain traction, and by 1908 it had become one of the top companies in the watchmaking industry in England. Hans now wanted to change the name of his company to something high-class, memorable and easy to say in any language. It also needed to be short so that it could easily fit on the dial of the watch. He spent a lot of time coming up with a name by combining five letters from the alphabet and finally came up with Rolex. He immediately realized that this was the perfect name and a few days later he registered the name Rolex as a trademark for Wilsdorf and Davis Lett in 1908. Over the next few years, Rolex became known for its high-quality wristwatches, and many wealthy people began to wear them. But it wasn't long before the First World War broke out, and many businesses, including watch firms, struggled. In some cases, they even had to close down, but not Rolex. This tragic event made Hans' company even more famous for its already reliable wristwatches. Many soldiers were issued Rolex watches instead of pocket watches because they were much easier and safer to use, and because they helped them coordinate their attacks better due to their time precision. By then, the company had grown so much that by 1914, they employed 60 people and had large open office spaces in London. To further boost their reliability, Rolex had obtained the first chronometer wristwatch rating from Switzerland and then the Class A precision certification from the Q Observatory in London. This made the brand more reliable for people to buy but not everything was perfect for Hans. In 1914, the British imposed a 33% tax on all companies registered in Great Britain that exported goods across international borders. This was a major concern for Hans, and to avoid these taxes, he moved the headquarters of his company from London to Benn, Switzerland. Another reason for the move was that due to World War II, the British began to dislike Germans because the name Hans Wilsdorf was clearly German, and although he had already registered Rolex, he was still using the name Wilsdorf and Davis in England. This led to a complete change of company name from Wilsdorf and Davis Limited to Rolex, Watch Corporation Limited in 1915. Ten years later, Hans also registered Rolex's famous trademark, the Five Star Crown logo, which has since been used on the dials of its watches. In 1919, Rolex Watch Corporation moved its main office from BN to Geneva, where it is still located today. From then on, the company focused on manufacturing its watch movements in BN and transported them to Geneva, carefully checking their accuracy, complementing them with high-class designs and launching its products. In Geneva, Hans and his team were doing their best to develop the technical innovations of the wristwatch. We must succeed in making a watch case so tight that our movements are permanently guaranteed against damage from dust, sweat, water, heat and cold, only then will the perfect accuracy of the Rolex watch be assured, thanks to its patience and determination. In 1926, Rolex launched the new model that would change the watch industry forever, the Rolex Boistaire. The first waterproof wristwatch in history, this new model was enclosed in a very tight case that provided optimal protection for the small watch movements inside and made it waterproof. Hans knew that this was revolutionary, and that people would definitely be interested, but in 1927 he decided to wait for the perfect opportunity to present it to the world in a very creative way. Hans heard about a woman from London, Mercedes Glitzer, who claimed she could swim across the 20.5-mile English Channel that separates England and France. People didn't believe her, so he prepared to do it again in front of thousands of people. Although the water temperature was much colder, 
Han saw the opportunity and encouraged her to wear a Rolex Oyster watch around her neck. After more than ten hours of swimming, he was pulled out of the water when he was almost freezing and managed to cross about four five of the channel. The mission was not a complete success, but the Rolex Oyster came out of the water in perfect condition. People went crazy for the watch, and Hans followed up the publicity by placing an ad about the event in front of the London Daily Mail newspaper. This is the point at which Rolex gained international fame as a revolutionary watch. To add to the excitement, Hans marketed his Rolex Oyster in fishbowls with real fish inside, in the sales window of every Rolex dealer for people to see as they passed by. This ingenious strategy worked amazingly well, and people became addicted to the products. Hans now decided to heavily advertise Rolex. In 1928, he worked with Evelyn Lane, the top British model of the time, to promote his watches, and of course there were photos of Lane wearing the wristwatch, a fishbowl. In 1933, Rolex oysters appeared in the newspaper, again in connection with a flight over Mount Everest, and the crew wearing their Rolexes were delighted to find that their watches were still in 100% working order after the flight. Another example was the famous driver Malcolm Campbell, who set a speed record by travelling 300 miles per hour in his Rolex. Despite all his successes, Hans sometimes struggled to gain a foothold in the market, and because of his German name, had to work twice as hard to build a successful company. When the Second World War broke out, Rolex was hit hard. It became difficult and expensive to export products outside Switzerland to some of the other major markets in Europe. Hans was frustrated by this, and tragedy added to his misfortune. His wife passed away in 1944. To keep her memory alive, he founded the Wilsdorf Foundation, a charitable organization for social causes. Shortly before Hans' death, he transferred 100% ownership of Rolex to the Will Store Foundation, which still owns and controls Rolex today. Rolex will therefore never go public or be sold and will never pay taxes, as it is essentially a charitable organization. Hans Wilsdorf died in 1960. After his death, Rolex began to approach itself as the luxury brand it is today. The company focused its marketing more on being an exclusive collection of watches for high society, and it worked. Another factor to consider is that in 1985, Rolex started making its watches with 904L, a very durable and expensive steel, and was the first to do so, which is one of the reasons for their expensive price. Today, Rolex remains the most recognized watch brand in the world. Hans Wilsdorf is the successful man who forged his own path from an orphan boy with nothing and built the watch industry into what we know today.